Welcome to the Best of MBS podcast, a collection of the best interviews hosted by Michael Bungay Stanier, best-selling author of The Coaching Habit and How to Begin. Today's interview is from The Coaching Habit podcast. Here's your host, MBS. I'm Michael Bungay Stanier. You're listening to The Coaching Habit podcast. And look, some people may know that I, my dark distant past, was a Rhodes Scholar. And one of the things that I'm sometimes asked is like, so is there this secret network of road scholars where the, you know in the corridors of power we get together and we do a special handshake and make a sign and we know each other and of course the answer to that is absolutely there's that group but i am not actually part of it they, they meet somewhere else i'm not invited but in my life are some wonderful people who i met as fellow road scholars when i was at oxford and i'm speaking to one of them today dr lizette neves now Lizette is an experienced social entrepreneur, a public sector leader, particularly in the world of education. She's actually these days a full professor at NYU where she teaches education leadership and policy, but she also works with her husband, Greg, who I I also know from Oxford, in an organization called Lingo Ventures, which is about supporting entrepreneurs in and around this world of innovation and leadership and education. So I'm super excited to be speaking with Lizette. Lizette, welcome. Hi, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. It's lovely to be talking to you. You know, we were just chatting before we hit the record button about, I think, uh, might have been two or three years ago since I last saw you when we come and hang out in Brooklyn. So it's nice to, uh, this, you know, this podcast, just a great excuse for me to go out and connect with people who I love and admire, you being one of those people. Yeah, well, we, we did our secret handshake over Thai food. That's what I... <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. So I've given people a sense of where where you've come from, but I'm curious to know these days, uh, you know, at Box of Crayons, one of the things we talk about is doing more great work, work that has more impact, work that has more meaning. So what does great work look like for you these days? Where's your focus? Oh, it's a great question. When I think about great work, I think about how to maximize impact and the way to do that or what are the kind of diverse platforms out there where I can be part of helping to translate experiences, uh, bring interesting leaders to the forefront, Mm. help entrepreneurs be more successful, particularly at the beginning stages. So much of the great work that you do is about obviously coaching. And I always think of coaching as getting people out of their own way, right? In some ways, right? Yeah. And so I feel like I look at whatever opportunity I do next that allows it to be great work is that it's a platform that lets me bring all of me, right? So NYU right now lets me bring all of me to the table. So nice. that's exciting. So how, when you think of all of you, what makes up all of Lizette and Eves? I mean, how do you think of the, yeah. the multifaceted woman that you are? So I think about it in a couple of ways. One is Lizette as the kind of creative builder. Mm. I like bringing in new programs, new ideas. Um, I am the person that wants to design my own course. If you give me a traditional course, I want to turn it upside down. That's what I enjoy. So status quo is not necessarily an exciting place for me. (laughs) Yeah, I'm (laughs) Um, totally with you on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I get inspired by your work, because it's kind of like this accidental kind of creative in some ways, too. Yeah. What I love is I just embrace that term now as part of it, because I also love places that where you can be, the other part of me is being really strategic and saying, we're going to be kind of the audiences or groups that I feel I want to have a connection with. Um, And so for me, I love being around learners. I love Mm. being around people that are interested in learning, or, or I like the challenge to inspire learners and inspire change. And then the last piece about me is also being you know, a very unapologetic Latina, you right. know, um, is is an important part of who I am. And so a place that accepts all those, it, it could be a good... <laughs> it's a nice place to hang matters. out. Yeah, exactly. So so one of the one of the quotes that I, I love, because it speaks to the slightly to the randomness of our lives, is uh, when inspiration is when your past suddenly makes sense. And my hypothesis is that we've had these moments where kind of crossroad moments where you're like, this was happening and I went this way instead of that way. And it kind of made all the difference. So as you look back in your past, were there one or two kind of crossroad moments that helped you get this sense of who you are and what your great work is? 
Yeah, you know, I think about, so it's interesting. When I was thinking of this question, I actually went back to when I was eight years old, which sounds like a, too early to have a crossroads, but right. I actually think it is a powerful crossroads. That's when my parents were very actively, it might've been even closer to nine or 10, actively engaged in organizing a rent strike. Right. And I, I think about that because every day coming home, I really got to see my parents take on what was not a good landlord situation yeah. and work with other residents to really change the situation. They ultimately won, but it told me a lot about political action. It told me that you have to be steadfast. It told me that when you want to make change, it's very threatening to people and you have to have strong resolve. And I always remember seeing my parents do that. They were, I cannot tell you how many times they were told you should stop this. They were offered money to stop it. I mean, you name it and they didn't. And I just, so when I think about that, it always made me think so much about what is my role in action and, and also being realistic that when you take a stand, don't assume that it's going to be this comfortable position you're putting yourself right. out there. And so right. that was a that was a key moment of when you say what's a change. My high school years and college years were all about that. And yeah. so that's one. Um, I think another big moment um, for me and thinking about that was a moment when I decided that I was going to be this kind of builder and creative person across different sectors. And so that's when I went into government for the first time. And both of my government experiences were with entrepreneurs. Who would have known? Not your mm. typical experiences. No. And it made me see government in a very different way. It made me feel extremely inspired about what does it mean to be responsible for the public will, right? And I, I think that is something that I al always go back to, especially because right now in the United States, we're in a very, um, we'll just say interesting time <laughs> around what does that mean? Right. And so I think those were two key points that, that I yeah. don't know, just imprinted me. I so. hear you. How does, um, I, lo I love that word you used about steadfastness, about when describing their parents and their commitment around we've drawn the line and we hold the line. And so how does, how does that, what, I mean, what does steadfast mean to you now? How, and how does that kind of show up in the work that you're doing? Wow. Well, <laughs> so right now I am leading the design of a new doctorate in education and it'll be both online and it'll as well as be in person. So a hybrid, Yeah. but it's, we're in a research one institution uh, I don't, I don't know what that means. What is research one? That, uh, a research one institution means it's a highly competitive research institution, so it really values research here. Ah, got it. Which, so, which means kind of like a flagship, right? It's yep. one of the tops, right? The challenge is, is that, you know, thinking about other ways of learning and broader audiences for work that could be done at NYU, that's not necessarily what folks have been thinking about here, right? right. So. I'm really, you know, I'm like shepherding change as a new person here. And so I have to kind of really remind myself, this is about the long term. And, you know, short setbacks, don't let them bring you back too far. Yeah, I like and, that. Yeah. And it's, it is one where I, I also say too, the, um, the thing that imprinted me about being in so many of these change projects in general, every role I've taken on is that I get that people have to mourn the past. They yeah. have to mourn that, right? Like I respect that. Mm. And I don't think it's trite. I don't think it's trivial. And so it's constantly balancing like this respect for what you believe that's existing and serving a population well while trying to inspire them to say this can do even better, right? So it's it's that balance, yeah. What have you learned about helping people mourn. I think it's such a powerful insight around how to make change happen, which is, you know, it, it enables people to move on when you provide the space and the ritual to kind of say a, a, like a, a formal farewell to something. But I mean, 
we can't all go out and like burn our Viking ship on a huge pyre of wood <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> just environmental laws just make that tricky these days. So how do you find space for people to mourn what might be past to allow the future to emerge? Well, one is, I know that you focus so much on and thinking about the coaching habit, about yeah. learning how people learn, right? Like that, yeah. aiding in their discovery of that. So I feel a lot of my work is also about acknowledging and being transparent that learning is emotional. Oh, it is emotional. I love that. And, and we don't treat it as that, right? Think about what's happening with our synapses at the time. Think about, you know, there's so many things happening that learning does have an emotional piece to it. Obviously, when we see when you're really excited about something, you're learning something new, when you're hearing tragic news, right? Learning is inherently emotional. So when I I understand that deeply and personally, so I, I try to think about the other person and say, okay, this might be the time to punctuate um, a team feeling better, giving an example, showing that what they worked on in the past, that they could see um, remnants of it in this future plan, right? right? Yeah. Right. So that they can they can stay hopeful. Right. Uh, the other part is sometimes you have to do some celebration. I mean, it, it varies, right? Yeah. Right? Sometimes there are people who don't want to traverse that experience, right? And it's time for them to move on. It's yeah. not always a happy moment, but. I think when you recognize, I guess the last piece when you say, how do you help them move? I guess the last thing I would say is when people are giving you feedback and change during a change situation, it's really about the change situation. It's not something else, <laughs> right. right? Like I joke about it, right? You know, my husband, if I'm arguing with him over some socks on the floor. <laughs> it's not, silly it's never about the socks. Yeah. It's never about the socks. So why do we think it's about the socks when we're talking about change, right? Like, yeah. so it's like unpacking that and not taking it personally, right? You know, it really, um, that insight is such a powerful one. It reminds me of um, the, the Marshall Rosenberg idea around um, the difference between wants and needs. Now, I know Marshall Rosenberg mostly oh, for yes. his idea around nonviolent communication. But mm -hmm. in, in that work, I think in the context of that work, he said, look, wants are the, the superficial things that people point to, like, for instance, the socks on the floor. But behind the want is always the need. And the needs are things like, you know, affection or um, understanding or protection or freedom or, you know, it's there's like eight or nine or ten oh, fundamental absolutely. human needs that drive us. And part of what you're pointing to, I think, is to allow change to happen, you need to see beyond the wants to understand the deeper needs that need to be honored as part of the process. Absolutely. And, and in this case, thinking particularly in an academic context, I think of myself as a rogue academic. I don't think of myself as a traditional <laughs> right. academic, but uh, because I'm so involved in different things, but it is about relevance. Yeah. Right. The need is for relevance, right? The need for some who are closer to retirement is legacy, right? Yeah. Right. And right. this is a big change. So I, like, I, I think about those things. Yeah. And that said, I mean, Greg, if you're listening to this podcast, you should pick up the socks off the floor. I mean, just deal with the socks, okay? <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm hoping he listens to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, and, and this is kind of building nicely on what we've been talking about, but w one of the questions I love to ask is, one of the things I know from the people I look to and admire is that they're people who are doing their own work. You know, it's not just teaching others or leading others or being successful. They've tended to have to sharpen their own saw, reflect on who they are, work through their own patterns. Um, so one of the questions I love to ask as part of this podcast is, you know, what's the hard lesson you've had to learn along the way? Or maybe you have to keep learning. Uh, for me, I, there's just a few lessons that keep showing up in different ways. I'm like, oh, that lesson, again, still yeah. haven't got the hang of it. So I'm curious for you, what's the, what's the hard lesson for you you keep learning? You know that context matters. Right. Um, and so for me, constantly, you know, so sometimes it's reminding yourself to slow down and to understand what are the different types of um, alliances that are there. What mm -hmm. are the incentives that are in an environment? They change in so many, and in each environment, they're different. And so I have to, sometimes I'm like, oh, how, why did that happen? I was like, oh, 
Right. I didn't slow down. And that's the number one thing that I know is necessary to be effective, right? Is sometimes Beautiful. you just got to slow down. Yeah, I love that. I, uh, you know, that an insight somebody told me years ago, which I too struggled to remember, but that whole piece around there's an invisible landscape around power and influence that if you don't slow down and seek to see it, you miss it, and then you stumble into a chasm or a cliff wall or whatever it might be. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the other one is, too, is that, you know, there are others who can help you navigate environments, right? You, you don't right. have to do it alone. That's the beautiful part. That's but beautiful. sometimes we forget that, too. <laughs> so the podcast is The Coaching Habit, and, and you know, the guests that I have on are brilliant, expert, proficient in their own way, but they've they've all got a degree of showing up as a coach or more coach-like in the work that they do. And what I know is that people who play these coaching, leading, mentoring roles often have one or two tools that they, they use and they love. They're kind of like, this is, my, this is one of my go-to things. So I'm wondering for you, when you're in that process of coaching and guiding and supporting others, is there a, a tool or a process or a model that you tend to you use, something that people listening in can go, oh, I could add that to my own toolkit? Absolutely. Um, one of the questions that I love is, it's a reflection of how complicated and hierarchical environments are quite often for yeah. the people that I'm coaching. And most of them are in large companies or large, complex bureaucratic organizations. And so I always ask, I said, how would A, your supervisor describe you? Mm. How would your peers describe you? And how would people who might be subordinate in the hierarchy describe you? Nice. And I ask those three questions because self-awareness is key. Yeah. <laughs> and if folks are not able to distinguish between those three. They're just not seeing all the multiple levels that are happening. Or more importantly, they're not even realizing the power and role that influence has in right. moving something, right? So when I, when I sometimes when I meet with uh, younger folks that might be coaching a, a default, and much like your question is, what's the problem or what's the real problem? Yeah. It usually becomes, a, it usually comes down to a personal relationship issue. It's really interesting, yeah. right? Like in, in a work environment. And it's also within this very strict hierarchical way of thinking of it. My supervisor, my boss, you know, that kind of thing. And yet my thing is, you know, sometimes it's it's also about saying what what I have what haven't I done to build out my influence skills on a right. peer level. Right. Um, which I a lot of people don't often try to think about it that way. It's it's not that I'm giving anything super insightful. I think my job is to really just inspire folks to to just add something else to think about that can spark something. Yeah. And that usually that question for some reason um, seems to get folks to really stop in their tracks, slow down, and start thinking about relationships in, in a much more complicated way, an interesting way. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I love both because it has a, a, a kind of double play to it, just like you're saying. First of all, asking that question helps people see themselves kind of more objectively and maybe see things that they might be overlooking or downplaying or diminishing in terms of who they are and how the, the impact they have in the world. But it also then allows them to think about what does this mean in terms of how I influence those around me? Because I don't know about you, Lizette, but the older I get, the more I realize I have no control over anything. <laughs> All I have is influence. So you need to understand how best to show up and influence. Oh, oh, I'm totally with you. I mean, <laughs> look, with this, <laughs> with the project I'm working on, it is about influence, right? Yeah. It is about, as you know, for parents out there, it's about only using your inside voice. There is no, Love it. <laughs> there, there is no kind of power and authority there in that sense. And, and actually, I think, I think that's a, um, it's, it also reminds folks how collaborative we have to be. Right. Right. Which I think is essentially social beings. And yet we're not encouraged to look at collaboration in a way strategically or yeah. provide skills to help people collaborate. I love that. It comes back to an earlier point you made, which is if you're doing it by yourself, you're kind of missing a trick here. Collaboration is 
necessarily and will amplify the work that you're doing. Yes, absolutely. Lizette, it is such a pleasure to talk to you. If people want to find out more about you and the work that you do, is there somewhere on the web that you can point them to? Sure. They can go to the website, which is called uh, lingoventures.us, or they can go to my NYU faculty profile at New York University and look me up. And it's Lisette Nieves. Either way. Lizette, thank you so much for being on the podcast with us today. And thank you so much. Pleasure talking to you. We hope you enjoyed this Best of MBS interview. Want more great content? Head to mbs.works. There you'll find MBS's new podcast, Two Pages. You can learn about his best-selling books, and you can join the newsletter. That's mbs.works.